Welcome to lecture number 21 for ECE461 control systems, root locus with repeated and complex poles and zeros. Now, what we did in our last lecture is draw the root locus for a system where the poles were not repeated. For example, if the poles at 0, minus 5, minus 20, I could draw the root locus. If you have repeated poles, one way to think about it is take the repeated poles and split them up so they're no longer repeated. Split them up, say, plus or minus epsilon. Then you no longer have repeated poles, and you can draw the root locus. What happens is these two poles, in terms of the real axis loci, these two poles come together and then split apart. So right away I've got the two poles at s equals 0, split apart, go straight up and down. Uh, from the lecture on error constants, now that's kind of useful when we want to look at error constants. Back on our lecture on error constants, we found that a type 1 system is better than type 0. Type 1 systems can track a step input. Type 2 systems are better than type 1. They track a parabolic input. Type 3 is better than type 2. Type 4 is better than type 3, and so on. So why not add a whole bunch of poles at s equals 0? Well, if you look at the root locus with repeated poles, you can see why. And to do that, I'll look at four different systems. I've got a pole at minus 5, minus 10. That's a type 0 system. Add a single pole at s equals 0 to make a type 1. Add two poles and add three poles. And watch what happens to the root locus plot. Now if I have a type 0 system, no poles at s equals 0, the pole at minus 5 and minus 10 come together, split apart at the midpoint, and there's your root locus plot. Type 0 system is very easy to work with, very easy to control. They're always stable. At least this one's always stable. If I had to adjust the gain on the fly, I would start with a low gain, crank up the gain until I get the overshoot that I want, and I'm done. Okay, so not a problem. A type 1 system. A type 1 system, I'd add a pole at s equals 0. That makes a type 1. Now instead the poles going between minus 5 and minus 10, they go between 0 and minus 5. So that pole at s equals 0 slowed it down. These two poles come together, split apart at the at the breakaway point, and then approach the asymptote. Again, this is not at, that hard to control. When I add a pole at s equals 0, I get a system which is stable when I increase k. As I crank up k, I start getting more faster and faster system, eventually start getting some overshoot. So again, adjusting k for, say, 20% overshoot is not that hard. Type 1 systems are fairly easy to stabilize as well. Now let's look at a type 2 system. Let's add two poles at s equals 0. And here treat that as a pole at plus epsilon and minus epsilon. These two poles come together, split apart, and go straight up and down. Then they're repelled by these other two poles. They get pushed right. So this is a case where if I have a type 2 system, I'll have an oscillatory system for almost any gain of k. And it's not just oscillatory, it's unstable. So type 2 systems tend to oscillate. It is possible to stabilize it. It's not easy. What I need to do is add a zero, configure poles repel, and zeros attract, put a pole to pull it left, and I can probably stabilize it. It's still going to be oscillatory, though. Uh, basically, type 2 systems are very difficult to control, and they're solving a problem that doesn't really exist. This came from trying to shoot down bombers flying over London, bottling them as a parabolic input. Um, it does solve that problem. It's not really a real-world problem that we're trying to solve, though. So I have come up with a solution that lets me solve a fictitious problem, but it makes real problems much, much worse. I have an oscillatory system. If I decide, let's add three poles at s equals 0, type 3 system. Now I've got three poles right here. One pole goes left. One pole takes off at 60 degrees. One takes off at minus 60. Then the pole that goes off at 60 degrees then gets repelled by the other two poles, and gets pushed right even further. So this is just a really hard system to stabilize. So by looking at root locus, I can kind of go back and answer that question. Why do we use type 1 systems? Well, type 1 is better than type 0. It'll track a constant set point. Type 1 systems are pretty easy to stabilize. We don't go to type 2, however, because type 2 systems are really hard to stabilize. They tend to oscillate. So the moral of this story is don't try to make the system type 2 unless you really, really have to. You're going to make your life really hard if you make it a type 2 system. Do strive, however, to make the system type 1. 
A single pull at s equals zero solves all sorts of problems. It can always track your constant set point. Um, it's not that hard to stabilize. It's um, tracks step inputs, which are really common, like a constant set point for temperature, uh, water level, speed of a motor. Type 1 systems do make a lot of sense. So most systems you're going to run into are type 1. Or if they're not type 1, you can usually make them better by making them type 1. That's some of the things the control engineer does. So that's kind of the repeated pulls. You can just treat them like a bunch of pulls slightly separated. And that also answers why we use type 1 rather than type 2, type 3. The second topic for today's lecture is what happens if you have complex pulls um, and complex zeros. And there's kind of a neat program in MATLAB. If you go to MATLAB, let's see, where are you? It's fighting me. There we go in MATLAB. If I input a system and do R locus, it'll draw the root locus of G. If I do RL tool, RL tool is kind of a neat uh, program. This is the root locus with pulls at 0, minus 5, minus 20. And I can sit there and say, where do I want to put the poles? Let's say right here. And it tells me, I guess you can't see it. There it is. Down at the bottom of the screen, for this spot, uh, the gain is 0.322. So as I move along, the gain, cha gain changes. What I can do with RL tool is start saying, well, what happens if I have poles and zeros? So let's add a single pole, like right here. And then I can slide it around. So here's my pole. If I pull it left, notice the dominant pole right over here doesn't really shift. As I take that pole and move it, take that pole and move it right, notice the poles repel. I'm pushing the root locus on the right further and further right. So again, poles repel. And let's erase that pole. And if poles repel, zeros attract. So let's add a zero like right here. That zero acts as a plus charge. The root locus plot is the path of an electron. The least electron right here is going to go up, get repelled by these two poles, then attracted by the zero. As I pull the zero right, it's going to attract the root locus. And sometimes you get kind of weird shapes. This is the Rooster polynomial. Uh, Rooster polynomial can get kind of weird. Oh, that's a zero. Uh, today we want to look at what happens if we have complex poles. If I have complex poles, let's put it right here. These complex poles also have root locus. I now have a fifth order system, five poles, so I have five asymptotes. The complex pole, the root locus leaves that complex pole at a departure angle. Thus we want to calculate what is that angle? With RL tool, you can sit there and move that pole around and see that departure angle is going to vary. What the departure angle does, if I want to sketch the root locus, I'm going to know the real axis loci, I know the breakaway point, I know the asymptotes. The departure angle tells me which pole goes to which asymptote. Here the departure angle is left, so it's going to go to this asymptote, and this, these two must go to the other as asymptote. Bring this guy left, or to the right, and notice that suddenly it switched. Now this pole, instead of going to the left asymptote, it now goes to the right asymptote. And the departure angle, the angle that it leaves at, can kind of tell you that. If you have a pole, it's called a departure angle. If I have a zero, let's erase that pole, add a zero instead. Zeros attract. So if I have a zero right here, these two poles come together, split apart, and go to the zero. This is the approach angle to the zero. And they leave a pole, approach a zero, so it's called an approach angle. And as you move the zero around, I get various approach angles. Again, sometimes they're not real obvious what's happening. But what, kind of what we're doing is doing the roots to a polynomial. Roots to polynomials sometimes get kind of weird, but that's the root locus plot. So that's the idea of an approach angle. Uh, let's see if we can calculate that. Now, to calculate it, any point on the root locus, the angles add up to 180 degrees. 
So the, the approach angle is what angle makes it add up to 180. For example, suppose I had this system. I've got five poles. What's the departure angle from the pole at minus 1 plus J3? Well, to do that, I can calculate the angles from everyone else. Angle from this pole, angle from this pole, angle from that pole. I know these three angles. This one I don't know. Well, the angles have to add up to 180 degrees. So what you do is add up to the things that you do know. These three add up to 160 degrees. The total has to be 180. So this angle must be 73 degrees. And that's 1 over s. When you invert a complex number, you change the sign of the angle. So the angle of s plus 1 is minus 73 degrees. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, 0 degrees is due right. 90 degrees is straight up. Minus 90 is straight down. The departure angle is minus 73 degrees. Um, zeros are the opposite of poles. When you leave a pole at a departure angle, you approach a zero at the approach angle. So again, if I have this system, three poles. Uh, where's the third pole? Oh, third pole's over here at minus 10. And two zeros at minus 1 plus minus j3. Calculate the approach angle. So this pole goes left, hits the d departure or breakaway point, then goes to the zero. This angle that it comes in at, I can calculate. Again, at any point in the root locus, angles add up to 180. At minus 1 plus j3, um, I can calculate the angle from this pole, angle from this pole, angle from the zero. I can calculate all this. This one I can't because I'm going to get zero, so leave that one out. This angle adds up to minus 73 degrees. The total is 180, meaning that this angle has to be minus 106 degrees. And that's what you're seeing here. Zero degrees is to the right, plus 90 is straight up, minus 90 straight down. It's a little bit past minus 90, minus 106 degrees. And that gives you departure angles. With that, you can sit there and sketch a root locus. Or if you do with something like have MATLAB draw the root locus, you can sit there and check. Uh, does the angle that I calculate match up with the root locus plot? That's lecture number 21 for ECE 461 control systems, root locus with complex poles and complex zeros.